I'm Judith Trotman and I'm a haematologist at Concord Repatriation General Hospital in Sydney uh, where I'm the director of our clinical research unit. My primary interest, uh, even though I'm a haematologist who treats patients across the broad spectrum of uh, blood cancers, my primary interest is in the management of lymphoma and uh, I have a particular subspecialty interest in the role of PET scanning in lymphoma and also in uh, advancing the treatments of Waldenstrom's. So I want to get, were to get a, be, a brief overview of Waldenstrom's. Firstly, it's a low-grade uh, B-cell lymphoma. Uh, which uh, resides in the bone marrow. It has to be uh, detected in the bone marrow for Waldenstrom's to be diagnosed. Uh, in addition to this uh, clonal population of B cells residing in the bone marrow, they uh, produce an immunoglobulin, immunoglobulin, it's always the hard word to say, they produce an immunoglobulin M, which is a large pentamer. And as that level of IgM grows in the blood, the blood can become very, very viscous, and that creates significant fatigue, uh, tiredness, nosebleeds, uh, headaches, uh, shortness of breath on exertion. Uh, and that very high IgM that makes the blood hyperviscosity is usually paired with a significant anemia, which also contributes to the fatigue. So probably the most overriding symptom of Waldenstrom's is the fatigue which may or may not be correlated with the IgM level or the haemoglobin. Lymphoma is often labelled as one disease, but it's actually a, an umbrella label for dozens of different types of cancer. Uh, approximately 10% of lymphomas are called Hodgkin lymphoma, but the vast majority of lymphomas are non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And of those non-Hodgkin lymphoma, the vast majority, some 85, 90%, are B-cell lymphomas. They are cancers of the B lymphocytes, which are, form an, a, one arm of our immune system. Now, B-cell lymphomas are divided into the very aggressive, the aggressive, and then the indolent or slow-growing lymphomas. And of those slow-growing lymphomas, the most common is follicular lymphoma, but also marginal zone lymphoma has a, a not insignificant numbers of patients here in Australia. But what is considered rare is Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. And with such a mouthful and such a rare disease, it's not surprising that patients quickly go to the internet Google their disease and fortunately can access some really valuable information about Waldenstrom's. I'm often asked what is, what is the biggest advance in the management of Waldenstrom's lymphoma and that advance has come from our identification of the mid-88 gene mutation. Uh, which drives uh, the B-cell receptor. Brutinib is a brutin tyrosine kinase inhibitor that switches off this key B-cell receptor and turns off the ongoing survival and replication of these Waldenstrom cells. And a brutinib and the other brutin tyrosine kinase inhibitors that have followed a brutinib, like acalabrutinib and xanabrutinib, they're a marvelous switch and they result in a down uh, regulation of the activity of the Waldenstrom's. Patients' IgM levels come down very rapidly within months and their haemoglobins can go up from 80 grams to 140 grams per litre within months of being on these B-cell receptor inhibitors. They have certainly resulted in the biggest advance in the well-being, the quality of life, as well as duration of life, almost certainly for patients with Waldenstrom's.
These brutin tyrosine kinase inhibitors have side effects. Uh, brutinib is, is well recognized for uh, the diarrhea, the relatively mild gastrointestinal upset that it can cause, as well as some uh, fatigue caused uh, by the, uh, the medicine itself, along with hypertension and a small increased risk of atrial fibrillation and a regular heartbeat that requires uh, blood thinning treatment and, and uh, rate control management. The later generation Bruton tyrosine kinase inhibitors that are not available in Australia but potentially could be available soon. Uh, Acalabrutinib has its own side effect of a short-term uh, headache when taking the medicine. Uh, and Xanabrutinib is a very interesting uh, Bruton tyrosine kinase inhibitor because it's so specific to that enzyme with very little off-target effect that is associated with very few side effects. Unfortunately, at the moment, while many Australian patients have had the opportunity to access abrutinib through the Innovate study, to access xanabrutinib through many of the uh, clinical trials conducted, uh, the phase one trials conducted with this agent, all the clinical trials for patients with Waldenstrom's have really completed recruitment at the moment. So we're in this hiatus, even though abrutinib and abrutinib in combination with rituximab has been approved by the FDA and abrutinib is approved in Europe, we yet don't have publicly funded access to abrutinib here in Australia. But uh, I have no doubt that that will come eventually. It's absolutely crucial when you are receiving a treatment for Waldenstrom's to have a basic understanding of how that treatment is going to affect your Waldenstrom's, but also how that treatment might affect you. What sort of side effects of that treatment do you need to watch out for? And there's no doubt that when you're having rituximab in com combination with chemotherapy, there may be some fatigue. However, that's more commonly counted by the resolution of the fatigue caused by the symptomatic Waldenstrom's. If someone receiving chemotherapy in 2018 gets significant nausea, that is a failure of modern medicine. We use very, very good preventative anti-nausea anti-emetic medications uh, starting even before the patient has their chemotherapy. One of the main side effects after having chemotherapy to watch out for is that high risk of infections, uh, particularly during what is called the neutrophil nadir, the very low period after the chemotherapy when your white cell count could be low and you're more susceptible to particular bacterial infections. Sometimes also, having completed your six cycles of chemotherapy, you can get an infection, particularly a viral infection, uh, many, many months after having completed chemotherapy, particularly in the context of having received bendamustine because of its uh, severe immune suppressive effect uh, as a side effect of uh, its treatment against the Waldenstrom's. There are a couple of particular uh, side effects that haematologists watch out for when giving patients rituximab in combination with chemotherapy. Because for patients who have a high IgM level, say an IgM level above 40 grams per litre, these patients have a high risk of what's called an IgM flare in the weeks after the beginning of the rituximab. And this is well recognized. And sometimes if this exacerbates their fatigue, their headaches, they may need what is called plasmapheresis to artificially reduce some of that circulating IgM pentma that is causing so much hyperviscosity. But generally speaking, because we're aware of this phenomenon, doctors watch very closely when they start patients with rituximab and chemotherapy and generally try to prevent it. Ibrutinib is not currently standard treatment here in Australia. Uh, and certainly the standard first-line treatments are 
Rituximab, the antibody targeted against the CD20 protein on the surface of the Waldenstrom cells in combination with chemotherapy, whether it be in combination with uh, dexamethasone and low-dose cyclophosphamide, or whether it be in combination with bendamustine. And this chemoimmunotherapy combination is given for six cycles uh, and is effectively a short-term uh, treatment approach aimed to get a good depth of remission that can then be uh, prolonged. I think in terms of access is where clinical trials are really important because they offer early access uh, to efficacious agents for patients uh, in, in various uh, cancer spheres. The contribution of patients to clinical trials, the contribution of them to the data that then provides the evidence for the use of a new medicine uh, is something that's very much uh, taken in, in consideration when, uh, you know, when regulatory authorities are, are looking at listing and funding new agents. It's the data that drives uh, listing. I think the first port of call for a patient learning about their illness is their treating haematologist. Because the treating haematologist will reveal to them the information that they are seeking in a way that is appropriate to that patient and tailored to that patient. Some patients can absorb uh, and write down an awful amount of information in that first consultation and in subsequent consultations. Other patients prefer to take a slower pace in absorbing uh, their uh, information about their illness and uh, the ramifications for, for them in their lives. And I think it's very important that patients learn at their own tempo. Along with the treating haematologist, they are surrounded by a team of nurse educators, social workers, physiotherapists, who can really help the patient uh, address the impact of the Waldenstroms in their lives. But there's also no doubt that the Waldenstroms community in particular, they're now digital natives. They're very internet savvy, and there are some fantastic internet resources specifically for patients with Waldenstroms. And there's no doubt that the first websites I would encourage people to go to are to that of WM Aussies and the International Waldenstroms Macroglobulinemia Foundation. One of the commonest questions I get asked about Waldenstrom's is, is it hereditary? And unlike most other lymphomas, there is definitely an increased risk of getting Waldenstrom's in family members of patients who have Waldenstrom's. And I think that increased risk is, is more than tenfold, maybe even as high as 20-fold. But people have to remember that Waldenstrom's is extremely rare, is a rare cancer. And so the risk to their family members of getting Waldenstrom's is still very low. But there's definitely probably about seven or eight percent of our patients who, in whom there is a, a fa familial history of, of Waldenstrom's. And that raises the question of whether siblings or whether children should be checked should have their total protein measured to see if it's elevated as a prelude to getting their immunoglobulins measured. And generally my answer is no. And it's important that family members are aware of this increased risk of, of Waldenstrom's.